Uh, welcome to the fourth annual Authors and Artists Festival, Rewilding. This is the fourth annual. My name is Paul Richmond, and I'm from Human Air Publishing, and I'm just one of the many hosts. There's three tracks going on at this festival. Uh, if you enjoy today, please let friends know about tomorrow. And check back, because there's going to be videos of all the tracks, all the panelists, everything happening uh, that happened throughout these two days. And there's some great writers and great presentations. So we hope you come back. As you can see, the many sponsors on the poster has made it possible for everybody to come in free. So please enjoy. Thank you very much. The authors that are going to be presenting in this half hour have their links in the chat for you to find their books. Many of them are with Human Air Publishing, but many of them have other publishers who have um, thought their work was as great as I did. And so please check it out. Um, they're really good authors. Um, and for our first uh, writer, we're going to jump right in. Please welcome uh, Margaret. Hello, uh, my name is Margaret Sarico from my newest collection, Even the Dog Was Quiet, as well as If There Is No Wind and Poems from Youth Write the Land, which I did uh, in New York State in Greenport, Columbia Conservancy. And also finally with uh, the Park River in Hartford with Writing the Land. Um, the first poem is called A Walk in the Gardens. Beauty and afterthought, the uncomplicated calla lily bends her back in the sun, leaves splayed takes center stage. A bird statue mounted on a stick with a succulent body, purple floral crown, and a brush feather tail points with her twisted beak. There, she instructs, look there, and so I do. I ask if she envies the living since they don't require a stake to stand erect. Does it bother her pretending to be a bird? She doesn't answer, but draws my emptiness towards living and life, away from death and dying. There, look there, my heart pulls, instructed by the sagacious, if not impatient, bird once again. A solitary yellow leaf clings to a tropical plant. Like a dancer in releve, she reaches, then leans. Will the bud at the top grow if she lets go? Nearby, a Japanese, Japanese katsura with a shadowy geometric widening array dedicated to one soul, a living memorial, feels at peace. I photograph her. My silhouette appears in the snapshot. I create, therefore I exist. Yet I dwell inside complexity, unlike the calla lily, sculpted bird, tropical plant, and katsura tree. Death overtakes my thoughts on any day these days, even while attended by sparrows, rabbits, and honeybees. We are the yellow leaves falling to the ground before our time. In the end, we may all be like the stilted bird, a reminder of life's past. Will the trees memorialize any of us? Second poem comes from uh, the Park River in Hartford, Connecticut. Right of way. Wisdom usually comes by hindsight. This is an old story and humankind is one character in our planetary parable. There have been voices to guide us along what the Algonquins called the Connecticut. Long ago, the great river was used to transport machine parts, bicycles, automobiles, washing a miasmic dissonance of waste into her water for energy and factories. Face it, humanity hungers for objects, a meaningless yet perilous dalliance. Once honored by the indigenous people, now used and abused by settlers, the river grew angry as tanneries, tenements, and garbage dumps stretched alongside her. The mighty water pressed her polluted self on land, flooding and spreading filth to where they lived and worked. In response, they imprisoned the Park River against her will, driving her through concrete conduits, roaring at indignities, rumbling, gurgling under the city streets. Her drenched history staged along a 78 mile stretch of land that was dispossessed and what was left, a watershed partially buried. As we ignore ecological truth, Humanity withers, land and water protectors plead with us to change our ways. The need and dependence on all things natural increases exponentially. And yet, the river can be a teacher, calling to us across the urban breath. 
as red-tailed hawks, deers, raccoons, skunks, and river rats reappear along her tributaries, unlocking the key to survival. Listen, you can still find her running behind a nursing home or university parking lot, beneath the public library and in the backwoods. And blue and green herons, mallards, wood ducks, pickerel, black-nosed dace, and large mouth bass have become fluent in river language again. So can we, as they make fleeting appearances in hopes they become permanent. Our parable as a fable can be rewritten where river is hero, humankind seeks to repair, asks for forgiveness and expresses gratitude. Tempest. A torrential rain collects on the flat roof across from where I sit safe and dry in a corridor near a large picture window. Someone tells me there is a slight pitch to the roof channeling water. I wait for the liquid to spill over the edge like an overfilled pot in the sink. The unsettling sound of thunder echoes in the hallway. The flash of lightning irritates my eyes. As the downpour continues, my thoughts move from storm to patient, trapped and dry in the waiting, Always in the waiting, I cannot touch the unease that ripens my insides. Strange how time continues slowly in the hospital and then the day is gone. I wonder how long it will be before the roof refuses to hold the rain, forcing the water to comply with the laws of physics. And despite the supposed human control of leaders and gutters, floods the grounds. away. Pregnant clouds hold the sun in an embrace. The woods appear beyond a small gravel lot. I am astounded as it opens before me, framed by the distant cat skills, the daylight barely illuminating the access for all trail, inviting me to walk and follow dirt arteries accompanied by insects and small animals who peek from tall grass as they scatter along the curvy meadow route. Bluebirds fly from their boxes, constructed lovingly by stewards of this land, one for them and one built for cranky tree swallows, I believe, and why not? They direct my attention down the trail as if the woods were not enough to a spectacular view of the Hudson River below. There, a gazebo, no, two, tucked, wait for me to sit and think about this land. I experience great delight that comes from discovering a place, one slip at a time. Excellent. And the last one from my latest book is called Causality. The millipede scurries up the steel sink. I capture him with a napkin, feel him twitch in my hand. Outside, I say, opening the door and shaking the cloth. Two of his legs remain, his body gone. Retracing my steps, I carry my guilt for the morning that ended his brief life. I pull the bed covers over my head, try and restart the day. I've altered lives before. My fear of distracting someone from safely crossing the street, introducing friends who marry, later divorce, offering misguided healing advice, setting events in motion, unable to halt inertia, whether at rest or not. If I don't interfere, nothing will happen a remedy to my cause and effect dilemma, a stilted approach to life. Troubled, I am a meddling fool, searching for the carcass of a millipede. Look what I've done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Any yeah, other readers, you, so Martha. fun to read with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now let's hear from Dina. Hi, everybody. I'm Dina Stander, and I have two books that I published with Human Error Publishing. One is called Old Bones and True Stories, and the other is called Housewife Blues. This poem is called Rosy Outlook. I have always been drawn to the underneath of things, a rock lifter from way back, a bark peeler, a snow sweeper, a looker under the log, 
I want to see what will crawl away. I love the way a clam can spit at you from under the sand. I like to watch crabs scuttle into the receding foam a wave has left behind, wielding its one long claw wildly, as if to catch the effervescence lifting off the bubbles, trying to get high, yeah. Clap crabs chasing a rush. <laughs> Back alleys and dark stairways also held an appeal, and never mind an entrance ramp or a railroad crossing where the trains come in slow. Beware the bus terminal where innocence is squashed by torrid disappointments and hopes eternal hymns run up against reality, like an ambulance bay and a bad storm, and yes, that there is loneliness I may wish I had never seen or run up against myself in the bleak underneath of human weather. I prefer the underneath of the woods to the underbelly of the human condition. I keep hoping there is some leap of faith we finesse in order to pull off sidestepping the dominionist dreams of Armageddon and white people rapture, the one where the rest of humanity misses the boat. Only most of, most of us would just as soon not catch that ride. So maybe all the bat she, shit crazy Christians no offense to bats, will ride off on a shiny arc at warp speed and the rest of us will be left behind here. And I don't know where here will be once they are done wringing earth dry of all her molten riches, all the wild beauty of the mag and all the magnificent untamable fury of a planet scorched by religion and greed. I wish I had some better, more rosy outlook I wish I had a rock to hide under or a log to roll across my hidey hole. I wish it was going to be safe someplace in the underneath because out here on top, I feel so exposed to the elements and vulnerable to fire and soggy from the floods. I wish I could finish things. I wish this deja vu of the last days would roll itself out across our screens with mercy. Fuck it. All I really hope for is mercy. This next poem is called A Apocalypse Poem. Urban Dictionary, Poco Apocalypse. The slow death of the human race brought on by our own mass consumerist philosophies and underlying disgust for ourselves and one another. Poco Apocalypse. There will be an afterwards a time when all of this and even the horrors to come will be over with and human beings will dust themselves off and get on with surviving in a gentler circumstance. This is what I tell myself when I think of Fukushima and the poison leaking into the sea. This is what I tell myself when I walk on a beach littered with a plethora of small plastic pieces. There will be an afterwards, a time when America will come to terms with the brutality that feeds our inequities, the desperation of Puerto Rico, and the political Russian roulette practiced in Washington. This is what I tell myself when I need to believe we won't all be blown to smithereens by a maniac with an ego problem or bedlam spawned by the mother of all horrifier natos that has no connection to climate change. There will be an afterwards when we learn to ride the storms and mourn our losses and adapt to whatever new world awaits humanity. I tell myself this as if it could possibly convey comfort. Some days, the uncertainty we endure in the here and now makes me concerned my head might just pop, like when the dog died and I worried I might have an aneurysm from trying so hard to understand loss. Afterwards, there will be a gentler circumstance, and even if it is always littered with small plastic pieces, our inequities and desperations notwithstanding, after we are blown to smithereens, we will even endure not understanding. We don't have to know how to survive. We just have to do it one breath at a time until there is no more air in the room, until there is no more time. These are heavy today. Gaza, 2023. Don't mistake my silence for silence. This absence of sound is a prolonged keening too long to be heard on earth. My mother calls to tell me she dreamed her Israeli self carried bags of food to the border fence stealthy in the dark of night, calling to the children she knew must be so hungry and afraid. In the dream, she never sees their faces, only little hands reaching from the shadows, grasping for connection. This unbearable, unreconcilable weight of watching from a distance while the world as we know it comes apart slowly and all at once, our crushed hopes and crushing fears all look the same in the rubble of a hospital. No, don't mistake my silence 
for silence. Next poem is called Teeth That Would Bite. Recovering from bad dreams, me and my general, me and my generational trauma were having a tete a tete in the blanket tent because hiding naked and safe in my bed is the best remedy when I know I am too old and gimpy to run from fascists. And besides, I'm thinking, tucked into the underneath. With the whole world burning, it seems wise to shelter in place. Just then. The dog's nose nestles in, seeking me under the cover. She sniffs my fear and sighs, a comfort, a comfort of dog breath, flashing teeth that would bite to protect me. Her steady love easing the old terrors that stalk my dreams. This is called Poem to Tame Bears. In the legends of my people, there is a story about a bear that wakes in the middle of winter and follows its nose to a house where a blind grandmother is making a holiday feast for her family. She mistakes the bear at the door for a human visitor and invites it to her table, piles a plate high, then spills all the family gossip. Her guest only grunts, its mouth stuffed full of deliciousness. She shrugs and serves seconds. The bear eats and leaves, Arriving guests see bear tracks in the snow. Rushing in, they find grandma humming, sweeping up after her uncouth friend. In the legends of my people, a bear may just be an opportunity to be generous. Sometimes there is nothing to fear from the bear at the door. Sometimes the hungry beast that wanders in the woods is a good neighbor who will eat and run without a ruckus. Sometimes it is better to toss the compost bucket and back away slowly. Bon appetit. Better to feed the bear than to feed the fear. fear. Hmm. Uh, last one, quick. Uh, it's called Post Poetry Festival on Zoom. Voices carry across the distance, each heart a drumbeat from the other side of the screen, shifting rhythm into sync, weaving a vessel of ceremony, each poet reading into the silence, their word music an offering to an audience muted in sacred listening together, holding the light, pushing against the terrible dark, signaling the universe with our wild joy in being, our, ex our exquisite ache, we are invincible. We are vulnerable. We are here. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for being here, Dina. And next up, we have Gail. Hello, everyone. My name is Gail Thomas, and I have uh, four poems to share today. I'm going to read from my newest book published by um, Human Error Publishing. Sorry, it's backwards. It's called Leaving Paradise. And thank you, Paul. Speaking of bears, Dina, I have Laika and the polar bear. My love won't watch a movie until she checks the website, does the dog die? People dying, no problem. I grew up watching Old Yeller with my father who never cried, weeping movie tears on the couch. Then there was Laika, the Soviet street dog who survived the centrifuge test and could eat and shit in a small space. When Sputnik 2 launched, her heart beat three times faster. By the fourth revolution, heat sensors failed and Laika died. Newsreels blast blared her contribution to man, but not her end. In four years, Yuri Gagarin launched from the same pad. Researchers say 700 species on every continent suffer loss of habitat, from tree frogs to snow leopards, chipmunks to elephants. Years later, her scientist trainer said, we did not learn enough from the mission to justify the death of a dog, while we watch a polar bear claw her way onto shrinking ice. <clears throat> and this poem is, is, I guess, my plea for the world. It's called Reclaiming the Word Lover. Tide strokes the shore. Tiny crabs burrow deeper. Bubbles blister, then break. 
glossy suck of sand inches recedes, then tumbles in rhythm. It's time for us to be lovers again, before we forget how to pull in, let go. Fire starts with tinder and breath, how it grows and spits blue and orange. We seek the hottest spots, balance logs, a shift here, there to coax the blaze. It's time for us to be lovers again, before we forget how to tend and stoke. Woods run amuck with wild carrot, ferns, skunk cabbage, the green thrust and spill, wriggling lives exposed under stones and rotting logs. It's time for us to be lovers again, before we forget how to open. Eclipse creates a rare fervor, we watch with glasses and pinhole viewers, or inside on screens, transfixed by two shifting ancient bodies for six minutes. It's time for us to be lovers again. This is a very short poem um, that I wrote when I um, was able to spend some time in Wyoming. It's called Panacea. Tangled yellow grass turns chrome under a gibbous prairie moon. Light sharp enough to saw bones. Wind keens and sweeps the wells of grief clean as an empty cabin. Wilderness, its lure and demise, the unmet hunger of human eyes. Um, I'm going to close with this poem. Um, I'm originally from, I was born and grew up as a young person in Pennsylvania. And so this poem references a lot of those um, places, but I think it's a, a universal plea. It's called Prayer for a Home Place. Oh, rivers who fed my roots, shad highways, loon waterbeds, conveyors of coal and factory sludge, bearers of kayaks and pesticides, connectors and dividers. Named by the Delaware, Onondaga, Lenny Lenape, renamed by the Germans, Dutch, English, Gawanawanane Gahunda, Susquehanna, Great Island River, Lekawekink, Lehigh, where there are forks, Manayunk Schuylkill, where we go to drink, Lackawanna, stream that forks. Oh, soil that held firm my roots, Pocono, a river between two mountains, Catasauqua, thirsty earth, Hakandakwa, searching for land, Kaple, even running stream, Maxitani, Bear Path Stream, Kittatinny, Endless Mountains. Forgive the builders of rails and interstates. Forgive the billboards, industrial parks, subdivisions. Forgive the tired ghosts of miners, steel workers, and farmers. Forgive those of us who left without cleaning up our messes. Bless the First Nations, the mothers who labor to restore each child, the eagles and trout, to recover each stream and strip of green. May old waters flow freely, crops grow cleanly. May you offer sanctuary to all who hunger and thirst for home without dams, without walls. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So thank yeah, you thank for you. listening. Thank you so much, Gail. That was excellent. Uh, now, we'll please welcome Janet. Hi, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here with you all. And uh, thank you so much for such beautiful work and uh, Paul for the for the publishing and the organizing. I'm going to read from my uh, human error book called What the Dead Want Me to Know. And this is also my mother's artwork. And also, I'm going to 
share some work from this Le Leveler's Press book called Bird of a Thousand Eyes and a couple of newer poems. So I wanted to say about the, um, the theme, rewilding and renewal seems to me uh, that it's about taking steps through fear into the next level of, of deeper witness and courage and, uh, and how we support each other to do that. I got a, a major dose of encouragement from Audre Lorde. I had the opportunity um, when I was about 20 years old to speak with her after reading. And she said to me, not only can you do this work, you must. So this first poem is dedicated to Audre Lorde and it's called To Speak These Petals Deeper. My voice brushed softly wild, a woman's yearning temple. Then ear to cheekbones, velvet skin, as if within a field of sunflowers, darkest eyes unseen. Even worse than the nightmare is the blank. In a dim back room, swaying breast to breast, not only can we dance, we must. To speak these petals deeper, each seed a spark, another chance to bloom to break the drone, the line that silences, to curve around and twined, to sing unbound in light, remembering to rise as those before us fly like a river of birds, pulsing, touching, undulates across the sky. This next poem is called Faint. 1930s high school girl feigned collapse like a marionette in a crush she would never forget. Her spattered smock draped form released from its strings to wake, head cushioned in the art teacher's lap, a woman who knew the difference between turquoise and aquamarine helped my mother stand the stab of fear she'd be, be revealed as the deeper secret sunk, like an anchor in river mud. And she kept her heart in the closet, in a green box so it wouldn't fade, and her wild hands painting swirled beyond that wordless frame. Queer Maps. Given as we have found queer maps in our palms, each other's hands to drink from, hold the heat in waves, our bodies twine curve by curve like question marks. We move through dark, then darker still, lit as a spark leaps from flint in silence, eye to eye singing the fire as word we fly. This next poem is about a man who I met in Cape Town during a performing arts teaching exchange in 2009. Um, he died in 2017. He actually inspired a whole program that's still going on there that a colleague of mine and I, Ingrid Askew, um, put into place and it continues called Labyrinth of Courage. So this man, Monobisi, a theater artist and gardener, spoke to me about what courage meant to him. Monobisi. My name, he said, like Mona Lisa. The dream you shared, a place I know. Spiraled mosaics, chanting within, a massive temple of sun. Your voice reminded me, he smiled, and told the story, gestures bold, hands scooping words like turquoise ripples from the sea. On a pitch black path he ran through childhood's gaping monsters, fine bolts and coiled snakes to fetch an egg from the neighbor. He could hear his mother calling. I see you, she sang, 
on the wind. When you're far away, I still see you. And his fear turned to wings. I have two more poems I'd like to share. This one is called Unlikely Bloom. I shone a flashlight down the morning glory's throat, open in the autumn dusk as I had never seen. Though other blooms twisted light as spindles, this one dared a single flare of longing into night. Tenacious word, hope, a sound no image holds, spun within. As cold air met blood warm breath, the purple funnel shivered. I saw the horn of a gramophone that before it was made did not exist. Who could have ever imagined it? Unless she had heard in the ink dark mist, a morning glory sing. And this last one begins with an epigraph by Muriel Rukeyser that says fire striking its word among us. Heron in the autumn shallows. Your curving belly, this fluid mirror seamless as love. You slip through silent water. Shimmers soak each hollow quill, frond of feather, silver blue cell until you are nothing but a glow within and beyond visible. Gold leaves float on shadows that break then join in ripples your slow legs weave. You give me cloud, river, sun disguised as bird. You offer dreams in languages I feel yet cannot speak, lost as I am within this burning. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you, Janet, that was excellent. Thank you so much. And um, now, Howie. I'm going to read uh, from Day, which is a human, human era publication that came out pretty recently. This one is called In It for the Carpentry. I thought I saw a goldfinch pluck a lie from an evangelical's mouth. Perhaps like the 17-year brood ex cicadas the time for swarming is now. I'd restore my rocks and shells to our lacerated planet, but won't live long enough to return to their origin, to be rescued or not. Imagine camels in our pre-Adamic hemisphere, eggshell fragments in a dinosaur nest, the Terra, Cretaceous remains from Hell Creek, Montana. Calculating how long since attending a wake, what may be needed, is the cleansing offered by funerals. There's no confusion facing a suddenly raging arroyo, only a scramble to higher ground. Capitalizing on the lethal virus, six million deaths and counting, an influencer's line of face masks sold out in hours. As Miro said, meaning comes later. On Bridge Street, there's forever a fish crow coring hoarsely by the liquor store following a raven over Taos Mountain at the outset of our 21st century and wandering into the Adobe Inn, Frank Morgan was blowing monks, well, you needn't. A bebop epiphany in a hip hop world. Of course, it's all madness. I wanna be awake when I die. And the next poem is the last poem in Stay called Once This Poem. Once this poem meant all things, as a grandfather of boys, father to women, as gar gardens in drought, as wax wings in snow, by the wild sarsaparilla, past the synagogue of tailors, past the synagogue of furriers, in this galaxy where everything moves away from everything else, what can the heart know? I don't know why. I, so young, stumbling from love to loss and back again, stumble bum, 
Um, now it could mean I'm older. It could mean it's getting hotter. I don't know yet. May never know. It's a poem in the making. Certainly not one meaning all things, though when it began, I was certain. This poem rooted where rooting is difficult, a quaking bog in Massachusetts where carnivorous bladderwort, sundew, and pitcher plant share life, where fireflies begin flashing when bats end their twilight run. Months will fly by, a freeze will set in, soon after it's hot again, colossal white pines, a touchstone. Black-eared kites in India tumble from the heavens, banyan branches sway in heat in the still of the night. Whether I think it or not, what I was, I am. This poem means caterpillars that devour their host, their upside down banded colors deepening to forest green, a vulture dodging traffic on the turnpike, risking for carry-on. This poem rooted in a November hour, sitting on the slip-covered couch with mom and dad, watching Jack Ruby assassinate the president's assassin. And in sweltering August, air-conditioned bedroom, our child hours from birth as the war criminal resigned a half century ago. As spirea follows forsythia, as flowering almond follows spirea, here the 15 glass panel door, the unrelenting windows, bookcase of the future, sacramental stovepipe, switchbacks of the past, as azalea follows witch hazel, as rhododendron follows lilac, shoes without feet, floors to walk, as common crows strutting, as paper wasps building. I don't know why darkness always precedes light or why light always follows darkness. In the end, what does the poem mean? What does the heart know? Okay, next poem is from the first book I had published called Dreaming of the Rain in Brooklyn. And it's called, it has an epigraph from Pope Gregory Twelfth. I have not understood the world and the world has not understood me. The poem is called The Extinction of the Black Rhino in Our Time or Older Man Emerging from Flowers. The sun is white and earth so incomprehensible, so remarkably obtuse, Sun rays refract off muddied homes half in the river. Until Nancy died, I hadn't grasped the significance when the flesh of our feet turns mottled. Minutes after the hurricane passed through, an inchworm yo-yoed from the clothesline. I heard a man being interviewed say, integrity is an algorithm. Is that like saying human beings are resilient? That's so repetitive. Besides, teratogenic products are widely available in every strip mall, and male frogs convert testosterone into estrogen, spawn fertile eggs thanks to herbicide-generated enzymes. More news. The tropopause continues to heat up. Rivers run brown with good dirt. But other times, say when night clangs its heavy gate, or when morning's another step up dreams lighthouse, House. It is possible to understand this world, except for Herbie, every man I've known remains a man, every woman a woman, every bull a bull, and every cow a cow, 11,000 years into the Holocene, summer lasts longer, and still it ends too soon, but even as memory's rusted chain snaps, we continue to learn. Once in the cemetery of the abstract expressionists, a fireball streaked the sodden sky, panting, painting you into being. I knew then you were promised, but not how long it would take to find you. Even though magnetic north is wildly unstable, sometimes I try recalling sheep in the middle of a road, gaunt men wielding wide sticks, high-stepping through the flock, what the air outside my car smelled like, to how loud their bleeding shudder. Within my small circle, each of us talks in our own way, just as sparrows' flight differs from swallows. We ask more than life will give, seeking the story of my life and others, what we look for through love and delusion is ourselves. Above this unlikely page hovers a fugitive from summer's finish, a six-legged fly with crossed translucent wings, bluish shell, narrow reddish head, and barrel at the other end. Earthquake of jeweled flight, dazzle of deepest wonder. 
tomorrow will most likely find it dead. All I want is to recreate it to, so you hear its buzzy song amid the plash of rain. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Howie. That was excellent. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the authors who read here today. I hope you will check out all their books. Uh, they're not only on Human Air Publishing. They are um, have many other publishers, many other publications. And as you heard, they have some great work. Uh, here's uh, a new one. Uh, I just came up with a, I don't, I don't know, but sometimes people use props. I go to this reading um, that happens every two weeks and once in a while they throw out a, a word to say, why don't you try this one? And this one was called freedom or the prompt was the word was freedom. So this is called freedom. How free am I? Freedom is defined as the right, the act to speak or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. On waking up, I decide what I wanted to have for breakfast. I wasn't being handed my food through the bars of a cell. Spray painted on the city walls. Who is the prisoner? We are all prisoners. We are all in prison. We are told we have freedom to choose from the choices offered. Others ask for more choices. How would you know that there are more choices? Not everyone is offered the same choices. Are they less free? Some feel free with the choices they have, and when they only are offered one choice, then people don't feel free. But then again, having 12 different orange juices to pick from, you still end up with orange juice. You felt that you made your own choice because you got the one that said real oranges. Once a week, they were allowed into a 12 by 16 square where they were to exercise their legs for 45 minutes. They were told to walk from one corner to the next in a square. They walked it diagonally, laughing out loud at their freedom. Growing up, I re was refused a cashier job because my hair was touching my ears. There were dress codes. Today at the store, I handed the cashier my money and they reached out their tattooed arm, several piercings on their face, sounding like wind chimes in the wind every time they tossed their head this way and that, which they did to move their rainbow hair from one side of their head to the other, which was shaved. The ad in the magazine on the cover of the counter said, we've come a long way, baby, as if to convince us that being able to look how we want while we are still being forced into poverty with low paying jobs is freedom. I hear them singing freedom, freedom. No matter how many people they hire to cover up the graffiti, every day I see the statements, who is the prisoner? We are all prisoners. We are all in prison. I tell myself, I am not a prisoner. I am not in a prison. I have this large country I can travel as I please. The report stated there was no need to build more prisons. The ones we have scare ever, enough people to not question that their lie, entire country has become a prison. Those who had more choices guard them. Battles are fought over wanting more choices, never about taking down the walls of the prison. We are told walls provide security. Yes, if you listen, you can hear them singing, freedom freedom. There are more choices in the back room to bring out. You need to quell the insurrections. Give them choices. Freedom, freedom. A child pulled on my shirt asking, why do I keep singing? Freedom, freedom. More importantly, the child wants to know why can't they have what they want when they want it? Free as a bird to fly wherever you want maybe right into the claws of an eagle, the bird that represents freedom. Freedom, freedom. This one is uh, some shorts. Superhero. The little boy asked mommy, am I a superhero? And the mother said, smiling, no. You're just another loser like mommy. Pretty. The little girl asked, am I pretty? 
Her mother smiled, hiding her pain, knowing the road pretty takes you down. Many survivors don't feel pretty at the end of the road. She wrote poetry. She was a poet. They talked about her legs, her clothes clinging to her, how they wanted to cling to her. Her words fell on deaf ears, depressing her. She wrote more poetry. Grandma is sleeping. The little boy asked, is grandma sleeping? No, grandma died. She went away. Where did she go? Where we won't see her anymore. Why won't we see grandma anymore? Does she not like us? No, grandma loved you. I will be sad if I don't see grandma anymore. Tell grandma I promise to be good if she will come and visit again. CEO. I cleaned toilets when I first came to this company and I've worked my way up. And I know firsthand that many of you have bad eating habits. Uh, let's see, do I have, I guess I have time. Let me just find this one other one here. This is a little bit longer one. And um, it's called Information Desk. I'll end with this. Hello. Yes, how can I help you? I need some information. Yes, that is why I'm here. What can I help you with, sir? Where to start? Well, let me show you a map, sir. See, you're right here. Yes, yes, here I am. No, no, I mean, see, here on the map, you're right here. Uh, where would you like to go? Well, I find myself asking, why does it matter that I go anywhere? Well, sir, there are so many places to go, but why? Well, there's great places here to buy things. I don't really need anything. Well, there's some great places to go eat. I'm not hungry, and besides, most of them don't serve real food. You could go out and look at the sunset on the patio. Yeah, I've seen it. Well, it is different each day, sir. Why are we always at war? I don't know that, sir. Would you like to know where cheese on everything is? They have a special today, extra cheese for no extra costs. Why the torture? Why are people inventing new ways to hurt people? I don't know that, sir. Why are people so afraid of pleasure? If pleasure is what you would like, sir, if you're looking for that, I can call up to hands-on massage and they have some openings this afternoon and they are on the second floor. Would you like me to call them? Will they know? You will have to tell them what you want, sir. Do you have a stiff neck, a lower back problem? I want to know why people find ways to create separation between themselves and nature, believing that they are superior. Sir, here is there is a spiritual bookstore on the third floor. You might want to go up there, and maybe you'll find some answers. Why are we abusing and destroying our planet, covering it in concrete? Sir, there's a plant store on the third floor. They have a sale on large house plants. When things look gloomy, I always go to the plants. I like the ones that have fragrant flowers. Will that save the bees? Will we stop poisoning our water, our lifeblood? If you're looking for water, sir, fresh water bottling is on the first floor. Down that hallway, they will carry the bottles to your car. It's nice to have someone to talk to. Well, sir, if you're looking for someone to talk to, you could go talk to a friend. They're on the second floor, uh, but they don't seem to have any openings today. Their computers are down. Maybe next Friday. What's today? Sir, today is a great day to talk sports, which is on the fourth floor. They're always open and they're always willing to talk sports. I used to think sports was honoring the skills, being amazed at the best. Now all the military propaganda, all the commentary, sexualization, the brutalization, the conquest is all that seems to matter. Sir, if games are what you want to play, they have on the fifth floor quite a large arcade. Up there, you, there's no waiting and you can play all the games you want. I don't want to play any games. You should try them, sir. They can be quite fun. I have lost all desire for fun. Seeing the destruction around me, I just want to close my eyes. If you need to close your eyes, if you need your eyes checked, sir, they are on the second floor, and you can have your eyes checked, and they have, you can buy glasses right next door. Isn't that convenient? I don't need to see the apocalypse in HD. I totally understand, sir. 
That's why I spent all my time in the other world on the seventh floor. They have the best virtual worlds. They have those wireless goggles so you can really immerse yourself. I would rather be here. I'm sorry, sir. You can't stay here. We are closing soon. We do have an information kiosk in the parking lot. Yeah, well, they sent me here. Sir, I suggest you go to I Need Help. They are on the first floor, and they are always open. Obviously, you are not accepting what's going on, and for some reason, you think that things need to change. I believe I used to have those feelings once. But just one visit and those little red pills they gave out, I'm feeling fantastic. Wait, sir, sir, are you listening to me? Sir, you're heading in the wrong direction. No, 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 I need help is the other way, sir. Sir, do you realize where you're going? Sir, okay, just so you know, you're heading towards liqueurs and homegrown dispensaries. If you keep going in that direction, you'll also find a church or two and a rehab center, probably. Take your pick. All right, have a good day. I'll end there. And um, I'd like to, uh, here, let me bring up the gallery view because we just have a, a second here. I'd like to thank everybody. If everybody wants to unmute, um, we have a little bit of time. If anybody wants to say anything else, um, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, I hope you'll check out the rest of the festival and stuff. Um, how's everybody doing? Good. It's really nice to see you all. And that I would, you couldn't hear me laughing at the end of that piece, which was too bad because I was laughing out loud. Oh, all right. Good. Well, I'll try to a little bit of laughter here and there. Yeah. The work today was just amazing. What a great way to start the day. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Really honored to be amongst all of you reading this morning. Really lovely. Feel the same way. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for being a part of it. And uh, like I said, I'll get in contact with you for more stuff in terms of that. I'll uh, do a couple of introductions because we have a, a little bit of time and then we'll be moving right into our, our next uh, 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 hour here. And I see that Stefan's here and uh, Kristen's Martin here. Uh -huh. So we're just waiting for the other folks. Anybody else have any other things they'd like to uh, put out or say while we have this last couple of minutes here? Thanks for everybody yeah. for keeping to your time and all that. <laughs> I, I just I just wanted to say I really, really appreciate everybody's work and um, doing this work together uh, is what helps me keep going from day to day and uh, feeling that sense of being able to step through fear into the next level of courage. I really appreciate everybody's courage. Right. You know, Janet, it's really interesting because we all had that theme in our work today. And that's not always the case. Right. And I, that really came through in everybody's work. So, hmm. I, I wonder what about the call of, of the, you know, the title of the festival rewilding I sat with that last night and said, what am I bringing to this? Mm -hmm. And, and we all, um, we all had that process of sitting with what, you know, what are we bringing to rewilding? And I guess we all found the same threads. Yeah. Mm. Great minds and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Paul, for organizing. Yes. yes and we thank you. Another publishing company. <laughs> Thank you.